Hello and welcome to Tag One Team Talks, the podcast and vlog of Tag One Consulting. Today we're going to be doing distributed load testing how to, a deep dive into running a gaggle with Tag One's open source Goose load testing framework. Our goal is to prove to you that Goose is both the most scalable load testing framework currently available and the easiest to scale. We're going to show you how to run a distributed load test yourself. And we're going to provide you with lots of code and examples to make it easy and possible for you to do this on your own. I'm Michael Myers, the Managing Director at Tag One, and joining me today is a star-studded cast. We have Jeremy Andrews, the founder and CEO of Tag One, who's also the original creator of Goose. We have Fabian Franz, our VP of Technology, who's made major contributions to Goose, especially around performance and scalability and Narayan Newton, our CTO, who has set up and uh, put together all the infrastructure that we're gonna be using to run these load tests. Jeremy, uh, why don't you take it away, give us uh, an overview uh, of what we're gonna be covering and, and let's jump into it. Yeah, so last time we were exploring with setting up a load test from a single server and confirm that Goose makes great use of that server. It leverages all the CPUs and ultimately tends to get as far as it can until the uplink slows it down. So today, what we're going to do is use a, a feature of Goose called gag a gaggle, which is a distributed load test. If you're familiar with Locust, it is like a swarm. And the way it, the way that this works with Goose, you have a, a manager process that you kick off and you say, I want to you know, simulate 20,000 users, and I'm expecting 10 workers to do this load. The manager process prepares things, and, and all the workers then connect in through a uh, TCP port, and it sends each of them a batch of users to run. And then each of them, the manager coordinates a start, each of the workers start at the same time, and, and then they send their statistics back to the managers so that you can actually see what happened in the end. What this nicely solves is if your uplink can only do so much traffic, or if you want traffic coming from multiple regions around the world, you can let Goose manage that for you and all of these different servers. So today, Ryan has set up a pretty cool test where we're going to be spinning up a lot of workers and he can talk about how many each one is not going to be working too hard. They'll run maybe a thousand users per server, which means it'll be at least 50% idle. It won't be maxing out the uplink on any given server. But in spite of that, we're going to show that working together in a gaggle, we can generate a huge amount of load. So Narayan, uh, if you can talk about what you've set up here. Sure. So what I built today is basically a simplistic Terraform tree. What is interesting about this is that we wanted to distribute the load between different regions. And for those people that have used Terraform in the past, that can be slightly odd in that you can only set one region for each AWS provider that Terraform uses to spin things up. So how we've done this is defined multiple providers, one for each region and a module that spins up our region workers. And we basically initialize multiple versions of the module, passing each a different region. So in the default test, we spin up 10 worker nodes in various regions, the Western part of the United States, the Eastern part of the United States, Ireland, Frankfurt, India, and Japan. With how the test currently works, it's the, the load testing trust, which is what we decided to call it, is a little limited because once you start it, you can't really interact with the workers themselves. They start up, they pull down Goose, and they run the test. The next revision of this would be something that has a clustering agent between the workers so that you can actually interact with the workers after they start. It gets very annoying to have to run Terraform to stand up these VMs all over the world, and then you want to make a change to them, you have to destroy all of them and then relaunch them, which isn't terrible, but as a testing sequence, it adds a lot of time just because it takes time to destroy and recreate these VMs. So the next revision of this would be something other than Goose creating a cluster of these VMs. How it currently works is that we're using Fedora Core OS so that we have a consistent base at each uh, location. And so I could only send it a single file for initialization. And then Fedora Core OS pulls down a container that has the Goose load test and a container that has a logging agent so that we can monitor 
the workers and send all the logs from the goose agents back to a central location. I had a quick question. So mm -hmm. now, um, the basic setup is that we have EC2 instances, like on AWS. Yes. And then we run containers like normal Kubernetes, like on them, or how is it working? It's using Docker. So that is the big thing that I want to improve. And I almost got there before today. What would be nicer is if we could use one of the IoT distributions or uh, Kubernetes at the edge distributions to run a very slim version of Kubernetes on each worker node so that we get a few things. One is cluster access so we can actually interact with the clusters, spread load, run multiple instances of Goose. It would be interesting to pack multiple instances of, of Goose on things like the higher end and also be able to actually edit the cluster after it's up and not have to destroy it and recreate it each time. The other thing is to get container D and not Docker, just because there are some issues that you can hit with that. As it stands right now, CoreOS ships with Docker running, and that's how you interact with it for the most part, is a uh, system control Docker. You could also use Podman, but I ran into issues with that for redirecting logs. So we are actually using Docker itself, and Docker is just running the container as you would in a local development environment. So, but what we are missing from a standard Kubernetes deployment thing that we would normally have is the ability to deploy a new container. You're saying that if I want to deploy a new container with this simplistic infrastructure right now, I need to shut down the EC2 instance and then start them yep. up again. Okay. So, so like that's, from, uh, that's exactly. the managing part. So like what I did when, before this test, Jeremy released a new branch with some changes to make this load test faster as on startup. What I did to deploy that is to run Terraform destroy, wait for it to kill all the VMs across the world, and then Terraform apply and wait for it to recreate all those VMs across the world. And like that is management style, honestly, but in this specific case, because we're doing sometimes micro iterations, it can get really annoying. Yeah, for sure. No, no, that makes perfect sense. I uh, just want to understand because I was like in this container world, you can just deploy a new container, but obviously you need a manager for that. So yes, sure. yes, <laughs> I could totally deploy a new container. So what I could do is have Terraform output the list of IPs and then I could SSH to each of them and pull a new container. But at that yeah. point, I... <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, there's another Git repository that I have started the version of this that uses a distribution of Kubernetes called K3S that is designed for CI systems and IoT and deployments to the edge. And it's a, it's a single binary version of Kubernetes where everything is wrapped into a single binary and starts on edge nodes and then can connect them all together. And so we could have a multi-region global cluster of this little Kubernetes agent, and then we could spin out gooses on that. And that you I think will actually work. You totally blew my mind. So now you've just signed up for, for a follow-up to, to, to <laughs> know that. <laughs> because that's, the, I mean, that's, that's what you want actually. But now I'm really, yeah. really curious, how does this Terraform configuration actually look? Can, can you share a little bit about it? So this is the current tree. If everyone can see that, it's pretty simplistic. So this is the main file that gets loaded. And then for every one, there's a module that is named after its region. They're all hitting that same actual module. It's just different revisions of this module. And then they take a worker count and their region and their provider. And the provider is what is actually separating them into regions. And then if you look at the region worker, which is where most of these things are happening, there's a variables thing, which is interesting because I have to define an AMI map because every region has a different AMI <laughs> because the regions are disparate. Like there's no, there's no consensus building between these regions for images. So one of the reasons I picked CoreOS is because it exists in each of these regions and can handle a single startup file. When, when we do the K3S version of this, K3S can run on Ubuntu and Ubuntu obviously exists in all these regions as well, but I'll still have to do something like this, or there's another way I can do it, but this was the way to do it for CoreOS. And then we set the instance type. This is, this is default. And then 
the main version of this is very simple. We initialize our key pair because I want to be able to SSH into these instances at some point and upload it to each region. We initialize a simple security group that allows me to SSH in to each region. And then a uh, simple instance that doesn't really have much because it's, it doesn't even have a large root device because we're not using it at all, basically. We're just spinning up a single container and then pushing the logs um, to Datadog, which is our central log um, agent. So even the logs aren't being written locally and that we associate a public IP address, we spin up the AMI, we look up which AMI we should use based on our region, and then we output the worker address. So the other part of this is the manager. The only real difference in this, we basically spin up the exact same way, is we also allow the goose port, which is 5115, and we spin up a DNS record that points to our manager because that DNS record is what all the region workers are going to point at. Um, and we make use of the fact that they're all using Route 53. So this update propagates really quickly. And that's basically that. It's pretty simple. Each just, just VM is question. running. Sorry, go ahead. Where do you actually put in the goose part? Because I've yeah. seen the VM. <laughs> yep. So each CoreOS VM can take a ignition file. The idea behind CoreOS is it was a project to simplify infrastructure that was based on containers. It became an underlying part of a lot of Kubernetes deployments because it's basically read-only in essence on a configuration level. It even can auto-update itself. It's a very interesting way of dealing with an operating system. It, its entire concept is you don't really interact with it outside of containers. It's just a stable base for containers that remains secure, can auto-update, is um, basically read-only and is essence and it takes these ignition files that define how it should set itself up on first boot so if we look at one of these ignition files I'm going to use file. we can see that it's basically yaml and we define the ssh key we want to get push we define an etsy host file to push we then define some system d units which include turning off se linux because we don't want to deal with that on short-lived workers. And then we define the goose service, which pulls down the image and right here actually starts goose. This is mostly defining the log driver, which ships logs back to Datadog. The log driver, the actual logging agent is started here. But then like this is one of the workers. So we pull the temp umami branch of goose. We start it up set it to worker, point it to the manager host, set it to be somewhat verbose, set the log driver to be Datadog, start up Datadog so that we get metrics from the logs. And then that's just how it runs. And this will restart over and over and over again. So you can actually run multiple tests with the same infrastructure. You just have to restart Goose on the manager and then the workers will kill themselves and then restart. And so you get this plan where it shows you where all these things is going to spin up. It's actually fairly long just because there are a lot of params for each EC2 instance and we're spinning up 11 of them, 10 plus the manager. You say that's fine and it goes and does it. And I will stop sharing my screen now as this is going to take a bit. <laughs> so is this already doing something now? Yes. And this is, you're probably going to see one of the quirks. And this is another thing I just like about this. Because we're using CoreOS, these are all coming up on an outdated AMI, and they're all going to reboot right there. <laughs> so, <laughs> because they come up, they start pulling the goose container, and then they start the update process. And they're not doing anything. So at that point, they think it's safe to update. And so they update and reboot. It's somewhat cool that that has no impact on anything. Like the entire infrastructure comes up, updates itself, reboots, and then continues on with what it's doing. But it's another little annoyance that I just don't. You spin up this infrastructure and you don't really have a ton of control over it. And so this is the logs of the manager process of Goose. And it's just waiting for its workers to connect. They're all... They've all updated, rebooted, and Goose is starting on them. 
as you can see, eight of them have completed that process. Is the, uh, you know, all of this stuff that you put together here, uh, is this going to be available open source for folks to download and leverage? Yep. Awesome. It's all online on our tagline consulting GitHub organization. And the K3S version will be as well. And that's the one I'd recommend you use. This one's real annoying. I know I keep going on about it, but like, this is how Skunk Works projects work. You make the first revision and you hate it. And then you decide to never do that again. And then you make the second revision. Okay, this is starting now. I'm gonna switch my screen over to the, the web browser so we can see what it's doing. Sure, great. The logs that we are seeing there, are they coming from the data doc or just the manager directly on so? That was a direct connection to the manager. If we go over to data dog here, there. There we are. <laughs> These are going to be the logs. As you can see, the host is uh, just like what an EC2 host name looks like. And they're all changing because we're getting logs from every agent as well as the worker. And you can see they're launching. If we go up back to Fastly, we can see we that go. we're getting global traffic. So we're getting traffic on the West Coast, the East Coast, Ireland, Frankfurt, and Mumbai. And the bandwidth will just keep ramping up from here. That's great. Uh, for the data doc, is there a way to also filter by the manager? Like sure. This is the live tail. We'll go to the past 15 minutes. And then you can go service goose. And then we have worker and manager. So mm -hmm. I can do only worker and that's Oh, sorry, only manager. The manager is pretty quiet. The workers are not. <laughs> you must have disabled displaying metrics regularly because I would have expected on the server to see that. If I did, I did not intend to, but I probably did. Can we, is it easy to quickly see what command you passed in or not to go back there from where you're at right now? It's in Terraform, I think. It is. Also here. So it must interesting. I'll have to figure out why you're not getting statistics on the manager because you should be getting statistics on the manager. Is this the log you're tailing? Or is this what's verbosely put out to the screen? This is what it's put out to the screen. Yeah, interesting. Okay. I would have expected statistics every 30 seconds. So what's kind of interesting is you can expand this and fastly and see we're doing significantly less traffic in Asia Pacific, but that makes sense considering we're only hitting one of the pops. And then Europe and North America tends to be about the same, but you can even drill down further. One quick question. I saw you hard code the IP address of the endpoint in the Terraform. How does Fastly still know essentially to which pop to root? Are they doing like some magic? Um, you mean I put the IP, the same IP address everywhere in SE hosts? Yep. Yeah, it's because of how they're doing traffic. So it is the same IP address everywhere, but they the IP address points to different things, basically. It's cool. A lot of CDNs do it that way. So instead of different IP addresses, it's basically routing tricks. We seem to have maxed out. Can you look at the... Yeah, this should be about it. It should be all started at this point. Yeah. So we've launched a thousand users with entity goose attack. So we have evened out at 14.5 gigabits per second, which is, I think what we got on one server with 10,000 users as well. This is more, this is more than a single server, single server. I think we maxed out at nine gigabit. Um, oh, okay. So it's awesome. Thank you guys all for joining us. It was really cool to see that in action. All the links we mentioned are going to be posted in the video summary and the blog post that correlates with this. Be sure to check out tagone.com slash goose. That's T-A-G, the number one, dot com. That's where we have all of our talks, documentation, links to GitHub. There's some really great blog posts there that will show you step-by-step -step with the code how to do everything that we covered today. So be sure to check that out. If you have any questions about Goose, please post them to the Goose issue queue so that we can share them with the community. Of course, if you like this talk, please remember to upvote, subscribe, and share it out. You can check 
out our past Tag One team talks on a wide variety of topics from open source and funding, getting funding on your open source projects to things like decoupled systems and architectures for web applications at tagone.com slash tag one team talks. As always, we'd love your feedback and input on both this episode, as well as ideas for future topics. You can email us at TTT uh, for tag team talks at tagone.com. Again, a huge thank you, uh, Jeremy, Fabian, and Ryan for walking us through this uh, and to everyone who tuned in today. Really appreciate you joining us. Take care.